So proponents of one saved, always saved, love to refer to the three parables of the lost in Luke chapter 15 because they believe they're proof texts for unconditional eternal security. But do they really prove one saved, always saved? Did Jesus even preach eternal security overall? Let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 15. You can see it right here on the screen, Luke chapter 15, and see what these parables actually mean, why Jesus taught them, and determine if they actually support this idea of unconditional eternal security. All right. So, guys, before we can even begin to attempt to understand these parables, before we can even look at them, guys, we must first, firstly, understand context. Jesus didn't randomly give these parables, all right? They were an intentional method of responding to a specific question, okay? So let's go ahead and look at that right now. In verses 1 through 3, we'll look at it right now. You can see it here on the screen, my friends, the first three verses. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So, verse 3, he spoke this parable to them, saying, Okay, so this is the context, guys. This is the context right here. There are people, tax collectors and sinners is what the Bible says. Tax collectors and sinners. People who are obviously not Christians. Well, of course, at that time, there were no Christians, but let's say they weren't really believers. They weren't followers of Christ. They wanted to hear his voice. They wanted to hear his teaching, but they have they were not yet his followers. They were not his disciples. They were just people who were sinners like you and I. They were sinners. Okay. And they drew near to Jesus because they wanted to hear him. And Jesus accepted them. He accepted them and he welcomed them into his presence. Okay. So that's what they said. So that's why the Pharisees and the scribes say this man receives sinners and eats with them. Okay. That's the context. This is key. If we fail to understand the reason why Jesus says what he's going to say, we will also fail to understand the message behind it. Okay, so that is the that is the context right there. So now let's go ahead and move to the first parable, the parable of the lost sheep. Okay, it's this one right here. Let me highlight it for you guys so we can stay on the same page. So this is what we're going to be reading right now, the parable of the lost sheep. Okay. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Amen. It's an awesome parable. But unfortunately, it is, it is misconstrued so much and so often, guys. What is Jesus actually saying? So, the first parable Jesus gives is right here. It's an analogy between a shepherd and his sheep. Now, it doesn't, he doesn't really specify that it's a shepherd, but someone who has sheep and goes after their own sheep is more than likely a shepherd. He doesn't specify that this person is a shepherd, but well, for the sake of this analogy, we'll just call it a shepherd. So, proponents of one saved, always saved, love this parable specifically because it seems to suggest that God the Father will go after his lost sheep until it is found, essentially ensuring our salvation since our shepherd is a good shepherd who never loses his sheep, right? Well, let's just consider that point of view for a second and look at this parable a little bit closer. And we're going to dissect this together, guys. So, firstly, did Jesus use a metaphorical person to symbolize himself? like he does in so many other parables? No, he doesn't do that in this parable, guys. He's actually not talking about himself in this parable. Here he makes it very clear that he is making an analogy based on his audience. He said, which of you men, which, what man of you, essentially, which one of you men having a hundred sheep, if you were to have a hundred sheep, wouldn't go after one of them that is lost. Like if you were a shepherd with your own fold and one of your sheep wanders away, would you not seek it out? Right? That's what he's saying. So Jesus is, not talk Jesus is not talking about himself. Instead, he is trying to make a point that the people of his day would understand. They understand shepherding and they understand the value of sheep. So to suggest that this parable is about Jesus pursuing his lost sheep doesn't really make contextual sense, guys. It's just not what he's saying here. Most parables, well, not most, let me say a lot of parables are 
reflections and analogy on Jesus, on God the Father. They're, they're oftentimes about him and his relationship directly with us. But this one, I don't know if we could say that. I really don't think that is reasonable to, to suggest that Jesus is talking about himself or God the Father because he doesn't really say that. He says, which man, what man of you, which of you people, which of you men would not go after your sheep that is lost instead of remaining with the 99 that are not lost? Okay. So that's one thing to consider if you're going to hold this one thing always saved opinion and point of view. Secondly, and this kind of ties into um, what I was saying, how could Jesus be talking about himself if he makes it absolutely clear that elsewhere in scripture that he will never lose any one of his sheep? He does not lose his sheep, right? Jesus makes it very clear he does not lose his sheep. He will not lose not one, okay? And now... Before you guys take that and say, okay, well, then this does prove once it's always saved. No, my friends, we need to understand what it means to be a sheep. Okay. Being a sheep is not simply an identity. It's not just you are a sheep and therefore you are a sheep forever. That's not the way it works. Being a sheep is really a status. And so we're going to look at that scripture right now where it talks about the sheep. Who are the sheep? Let's go ahead and read John 10, a few verses around the 27 mark. Well, we'll start at verse 22. So this is the shepherd knows his sheep, John 10, 22. Okay. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them. I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name. They bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So the key, the key verse is right here. All right. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep are known by me, by Jesus. The sheep are known by Jesus and the sheep follow Jesus. So in order to be a sheep, that means you obey Jesus Christ. You follow after him. Okay. You are not a sheep if you are not following after him, lest, let alone believing in him. That's why he told the, these people, you are not my sheep. You don't know. You, 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 I've told you already, you do not believe me because you're not my sheep. If they were his sheep, if they were following after him, believing in him, believing the words that he says, believing the works that he does, then the Lord would know them and the, he and they would know the Lord. And I made a video going in depth as to what it takes, what it actually means to be a sheep, to be known by the Lord in a separate video. So guys, if you haven't checked that out, I highly encourage you guys to watch it because I go in depth defining what it means to be a sheep which means being known by the Lord and what it means to be known by the Lord, which means to be loved by the Lord and being loved by the Lord means you obey and follow the Lord. That is how we love Jesus Christ. It is obedience. It is not just a heart posture. It is obedience. If you love God, you will obey his commandments. That's what Jesus said. Okay. So that's what he's talking about here. In order to be a sheep of the fold, a sheep of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, you need to be following him. And that is an active thing active tense you are not a sheep at one mo at one point and because you were a sheep then therefore you're perpetually going to be a sheep for the rest of your life no just because you followed jesus christ 30 years ago does not mean you're automatically going to be following jesus christ today that's not how it works we need to actively pick up our cross daily and follow after jesus christ amen so that's the idea of what it means to be a sheep okay so keep that in mind guys keep that in mind as we go back to the, what we're talking about here in the parable of the lost sheep so this is my, this is really my point here with this parable. And the reason why I don't think that it's wise to say this is talking about Jesus, because I do not believe Jesus loses his sheep. He does not lose his sheep. He is the good shepherd. None of, no, none of his sheep are, he's, he's so, he is so good, so faithful and so watchful. Okay. And he is the best protection that could ever exist for us. All right. There's nothing like Jesus. There's nothing like, there's no shepherd like the Christ. Okay, so the idea of, of him losing one of his sheep as if it was his responsibility, like it's talking about in this parable, it says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, like that's, 
That's to say that really points to the fact that it's the fault of the shepherd. And I refuse to believe that Jesus ever loses his sheep. It's not his fault that one of his sheep are no longer in his fold. I refuse to believe that. I believe that is blatantly unbiblical and uncharacteristic of the Christ, of our Messiah. He does not lose us. We walk away. We choose to leave the fold. We choose to remove ourselves from the protection of the flock. Amen. So I do not believe, guys, I want to say it again, I do not believe that the parable of the lost sheep is a, is a reflection of Christ and us. I do not believe that. And I think that's one of the main reasons why this parable is so beloved by the ones who always say proponents, because they look at this as if it is about Jesus when it in fact is not. It simply isn't. Verse 5, And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Right? I have found my sheep, which was lost. He sought out after that lost sheep. And I believe, I truly believe that Jesus does that as well. I just don't believe it the way that the one saved, always saved believers believe it. Okay? I think very clearly in regards to scripture, and again, there's three parables here. There's three parables Jesus gives as a response to the same remark from the Pharisees. So we're going to look at all three of them. Okay. Yes, he does seek after the lost, those that were once his and have, and have backslidden because the sheep, this is very clear that they, this is already a sheep. What man are you, what man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one of them? Okay. So losing one of the sheep. Remember what we talked about being a sheep. A sheep is a Christian. Okay, they're known by the Lord, they know the Lord, they follow him, they hear his voice, and they, they know him, and they are known by the Lord. That is a sheep. So if a sheep wanders away, wanders astray, okay, becomes lost, once again, the good shepherd seeks after them. Yes, he does. But regardless, at the end of the day, it is the sheep's choice whether or not he's going to accept, he or she is going to accept the shepherd's love and compassion or not. The shepherd is not going to force it back into his flock. And that can seem to be the case when you read this parable, but guys, we cannot read into this. We need to take all of scripture, the totality of scripture, and see the grand picture that Jesus is trying to paint. And that is the reason why I believe he gave three parables and not just one. Okay? So keep that in mind. What it means to be a sheep. Okay? And guys, right here, verse 7 Guys, this is the whole purpose of this parable, this answer, what Jesus is trying to say with these parables. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. This alone, the fact that it's in the exact same parable, this is, this is the closure, the conclusion to this, this parable, makes it so very plain that one who's always saved is not true. The fact that people use these parables to prove and support once is always saved means that they are really not understanding scripture, one. They are cherry picking bits and pieces of specific scriptures. And it's like, it's unbelievable. Look, if this was, if this was a, uh, a proof text for once is always saved, verse seven cannot make any sense because the, this parable is about sheep, people who are already sheep. Okay, the sheep are the believers. If he loses any one of his sheep, and he says, I say to you, likewise, there, likewise, that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Who is the sinner in this analogy, in this parable? It's the sheep. The sheep needs to repent. Repent. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. The sheep who are sheep, those who are actually sheep and are in the fold, in the flock, following after Jesus Christ, are known and know the Lord. They don't need to be, they don't need to repent of all their sin because they've already done that. Of course, I'm not saying you never need to repent ever again. We still need to confess and repent of our sin. But essentially the parable, what he's trying to say is that people that do not need any repentance are not those that need to be sought after and preached to. That's what Jesus is doing. That's the reason he came to this earth. That's why he came to seek the lost and give them hope, give them a, a gift of salvation to, the, to those who freely believe. Amen. So that's the parable of the lost sheep. Okay. Now let's go ahead and move to the parable of the lost coin. This one's very small, but it's very, very, very similar to the first one, the parable of the lost sheep. And it reads, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, rejoice with me, 
for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, very similar. It's basically the same thing. The only difference is that this is not talking about a coin. Something that is literally not even alive. It doesn't have the capacity to wander away. So it's pretty interesting that the Lord uses this analogy. But nonetheless, let's move on. Not because I can't refute this or anything, but because it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It says, verse 10, there is more joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's the same thing. It's just painted in a different way. So it's the same thing. I just wanted to look at the parable of the prodigal son because this one is the longest. As you can see, it's significantly longer than the other two. And this one goes into much more detail and is very different from the other two. And I think this one does paint a picture about God the Father. I think this one is very unique from the other two. It's still painting the same picture, but we should really look at it carefully and understand the context that we did earlier, right here. This is the context, why Jesus is saying what he says and what it actually means. So let's go ahead and read it right now, starting at verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me, essentially the inheritance that belongs to me, that, I'm, that is rightfully mine. So he divided to them, them being his two sons, he divided to them his livelihood, in other words, inheritance. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He, he began to be in need. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Wow. That's sad, man. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, in other words, when he came to his senses, he finally woke up. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. This is what I'm going to do. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That's humility. That's repentance right now. That's a broken and contrite heart, the heart that God's looking for. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. So he went back. He started. He, he set back to the course of his father's land. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Guys, this word compassion is the same compassion that Jesus had all the time over people. It's the compassion of God the Father, a, a agape compassion, an agape love. And the father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Wow. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Wow. Wow. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, he, didn't, he completely ignored what his son said. He's like, he, his compassion overcame him. Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Wow. We're going to really study that right there, the dead and alive again. So keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that soon. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to them, and he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So the son answered and said to his father, lo, the, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you have never gave, and you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Verse thirty. But as soon as this son of yours came, who dev, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Verse thirty one. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Wow. Guys, 
this parable is honestly so clearly not teaching one saved, always saved. I really don't understand why they take this parable and run with it to make it out to be a pro one saved, always saved proof text of some kind. I just don't understand it. Like, do we not just read, do we not, are we not reading the same thing? Parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin. They are all painting the same picture. And the parable of the lost son is the most intentional one. It really is. And this one, guys, now this one, I do believe, is in fact talking about the Lord and Savior. He is, it is talking about God. Okay. The Father, I truly believe, represents God. It is His heart. Okay. So let's go ahead and dissect this. Let's look at the key points right here. So the first one here, wasted his possessions. So this guy, he literally squandered the inheritance that he, that he was rightfully, that he had the rightful privilege of as of being a son. Being a son, you have the right of an inheritance. And we as Christians have an inheritance. And it's talked about all over the entire Word of God, all over the New Testament. So if you're not familiar with that, look into it. Okay? So later on it says, but when he came to himself, and I mentioned this earlier, when he came to his senses, the son came to his senses. He woke up and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perished with hunger. All right. So, and then we see that he, you know, came back to his father and was repentant. He actually had a broken and contrite heart of repentance. Now, the key part right here, and this is what I believe is makes it very clear that one thing always saved is not true, is this. My son was dead and is alive again. Keyword again. All right. So let's go ahead and look at what this word right here first. Dead. My son... My son was dead. Proponents of one who's always saved, the reason they love this is because they say the son never ceased to be his son. Right? So if you never cease to be his son, the inheritance is it's there. The salvation, the gift of eternal life is there and it cannot be lost. It cannot be revoked because you are a son. If once you're once you're a son, you're always a son. And the son is given eternal life. I don't know where they're seeing that in scripture because that's not scriptural. The ones that get eternal life are the sheep. Not necessarily the sons, it's the sheep. And the sheep are the ones that know the Lord, are known by the Lord. And being known by the Lord means that you love the Lord. And loving the Lord means that you follow Him and obey Him. That's the one. That is the person that receives eternal life. That is the one that will never, that no one will be able to snatch out of my Father's hand. Those are the ones that are given eternal life. Praise God. So let's go ahead and look at this word right here, dead. What does this word mean? This is the word necros. Might be pronounced different, probably necros, I don't know. And it's an ad- adjective, okay? And it means dead, right? Properly, it should, you're literally dead. One that has breathed his last, lifeless, deceased, departed, one whose soul is in heaven or hell, destitute of life. And metaphorically, it means spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Now, I believe this is the kind of death, sorry, the kind of dead that, was, that is talked about in this parable. And the reason I think that is because Guys, obviously the son wasn't actually dead. He was not physically dead. Obviously, he was, he ran away. He came back. They threw a party for him. The father hugged him, had compassion on him. He was obviously physically alive. So what kind of death or what kind of dead is the father talking about? It's spiritual death. Spiritual death. Not physical death. Okay? It's the kind of death that is spiritual. He was spiritually dead, deceased. That's the kind of death that he was talking about. My son was dead and is alive again. Guys, this is key. He was spiritually dead. My son was spiritually dead. Once they always say proponents like to think that, you know, once you're a son, you're always a son. And if you're always a son, you're always saved. Like being a son is is, is what gives you eternal life. That's not what it is. That is not biblical, my friends. Do not fall for these false doctrines. They tickle your ears and they sound really good, but they are false doctrines of demons. They are twisted, very twisted. They're made to make you indifferent and dull. Don't fall for them. You can be a son and be a dead son, a spiritually dead son. I can be a spiritually dead son of the Father. And if I'm spiritually dead, What makes us think that I can be spiritually dead and still have the light of life in me? You cannot be spiritually dead and have the light of eternal life, the light of God in you. He's the one that makes us alive. We are alive in Christ, not dead in Christ. The Lord is the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. That's what the Bible says, right? So if we're dead, if we're spiritually dead, we are not in Christ. We are not his. 
Amen. For my son was dead. He was spiritually dead and now is alive once again. Hallelujah, guys. Do you see what is being said right here, my friends? He is alive again. That means he was, of course, it says it right there. He was dead and now he's alive again. So let's look at this in a timeline fashion. So before he left, before he squandered his inheritance and abandoned his father, he was alive. He was an, he was a, he was an alive son of the father. After the decision that he made, he chose to run away to, to abandon his father. He chose, he said, I don't want to be with you anymore. I don't want to be yours anymore. I don't even want to be here. I don't want to be here. And he left. He left his father and then he became dead. He became lost, lost and dead, spiritually dead, spiritually lost. Okay. And then it, through the repentance, and this is the same, this is the key. This is the key right here. This is why Jesus in the other two parables says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. This is what it's about. It's about repentance. It is on us to repent, to acknowledge our sin, to wake up like the prodigal son did. He woke up, came to his senses and was like, wow, why would I leave my father? Why would I leave his goodness? <laughs> that is the point of this. This is this literally is the opposite of one saved, always saved. This proves that you can be saved. You can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can be his child, his sheep, and still choose to run away, to revoke yourself, to, to remove yourself from the flock, from his protection, from his hand. You can choose to leave him and abandon the faith, the comforting arms of Father God, and choose sin. You can do that. He gives us that free will. God is so good that he gives us the choice to do whatever we want. Even if it, even if it's at his expense, the expense, his, his own heart's expense, it pains him. It breaks his heart to see his own departing from him. He hates that. He does not, he does not delight in the death of the wicked. He does not. He desires all men to repent and live. That's God's heart. So guys, this, this parable, all these parables are so clearly debunking one saved, always saved. I don't understand why people use these verses to say one saved, always saved. No, this son, yes, he was always a son, but he was at one point a son that was alive and another, he was a son that was dead. If you think that you can be a dead son, a dead, spiritually dull, dead, useless son and still be en route to heaven, you do not know scripture, my friends. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And we need to be alive in Christ, alive via the light of life that only God gives. The light, the, the living water that we will never thirst if we drink of it. That's a constant present tense. If we drink this living water, we will no longer thirst and we will have eternal life. That is not you drank it at one point and thus, thus you have eternal life. No. We continue to drink. We continue to eat of his flesh. We continue to pick up our cross daily. That is the Bible, my friends. That is the truth. So my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. Guys, this does not prove one saved, always saved at all. Your brother was dead and is alive again. My friends, it's very clear. It's very clear. If we, as a son of God, being alive. We are made alive in Christ through him. We are made alive through Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary, what he did on the cross for our sins. We accept that we place our faith in him and we start following after him. We make him Lord and obey him, right? That is not a, that is not something that, that we do in one moment and therefore we're secure for the rest of our life. Look at this son. Look at this son. He was a son. He had this inheritance and he squandered it. He squandered his inheritance. He left his father. He left his home. The sheep, the sheep was a sheep in the flock and it lost, it got lost. It left the flock. Well, why, why it did so? We don't know. Sheep are stupid. We're stupid. We are fickle beings and we are, we give ourselves over to the enticement of sin all the time. Okay. Sin is very, very attractive. And if we're not careful, we can fall for that trap. Even after receiving the knowledge of truth, if we become entangled once again, after we have escaped the pollutions of this world, this is the Bible guys. We can leave. We can revoke. We can remove ourselves and abandon our faith. We can let go of what we've been given, which is eternal life. Man. How sad is that? That's a reality that is just so sad and people need to be aware of so that they hold on. They firmly hold on to what they have. Like Paul says over and over again, hold on, keep a firm grasp to what you have and to what you've been taught. The true gospel, the eternal life that comes from Christ Jesus, our Lord. So guys, 
please, 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 please do not think that the Bible teaches one day to always save. Do not think that Jesus t- preached unconditional eternal security because he did not and he does not to this day. He does not. He preaches obedience, lifelong endurance, patient endurance until the end. Amen. Amen, guys. So if we are his son, let us continue to be a son that is alive. Let us be in Christ alive, enduring until the end, picking up our cross, denying ourselves daily and following after Jesus Christ until the very end. That is what it takes to receive eternal life, the inheritance of the sheep, the inheritance of those alive sons, the people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ and follow him until the end. Amen. That is what these parables are about. They are about repentance and having a broken and contrite heart of following after Jesus Christ until the very end. It is not one saved, always saved. It is about a sinner repenting and returning to Jesus Christ. And it does not have to do with only those who have never known Jesus. That very much, as you can see with the parable of the prodigal son, it is about those who have known Jesus already as well and have abandoned the faith and then repent as well and come back to Christ. We can be those people. Just because we are Christians now does not mean we are going to be a Christian forever. We can abandon the faith just like this prodigal son did. Amen. So guys, that is the, that I believe is the purpose of these parables. It is not proving once he's always saved. If anything, it is the exact opposite. So thank you guys for watching. That is the parable of the lost. Sorry, the three parables of the lost. I pray that this message blessed you and that you have learned something new from this study and i know i learned a lot from it i heard a lot about the prodigal son and how that's you know once it's always saved and i haven't really studied it until now and after studying guys it's just so clear that's not this is not once it's always saved it is literally the exact opposite so if you guys have any questions or concerns please leave them leave comments down below so i can engage with you have conversation with you i pray that this is a blessing to you and that you're encouraged edified and challenged to grow in your faith like never before as i continue to grow as well Bless you all in Jesus' mighty name, and I will see you in the next live stream and in the next videos to come on this channel. Remember, videos come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern time, and short videos will come out every other fifth day. Sorry, not every other fifth day, every fifth day. So stay tuned for that. God bless you guys. I love each and every single one of you, and stay blessed and continue fast in the faith. God bless you guys.